Professor of Geography and Biology at Clark University, where he also directs the Forest Ecology Research Lab. He received his bachelor's degree in environmental resource management and a master's in ecology from Penn State. He received his PhD in geography from the University of Colorado. His, um, his research is focused on disturbance ecology of mountain forest ecosystems in the Rocky Mountains and the European Alps. And today he's going to talk to us about the consequences of changing disturbance regimes for quaking aspen in the western United States. Thank you, Doc. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And thanks, Greg, for that talk. It was better than the Jack Johnson concert. <laughs> so, no, thank you for that. So <clears throat> I was invited to talk about the consequences of changing disturbance regimes for quaking aspen in the western United States. And if we talk about changing disturbance regimes, almost necessarily we, we have to talk about uh, changes in climate because there are other drivers of changing disturbance regimes, uh, changing land use, management, and so forth. But as Greg was pointing to, I think climate change is kind of the big uh, driver here. So backing up a little bit, if we just think about climate change for a moment, we can talk about the direct effects of climate change. Um, altered temperature and precipitation regimes, uh, droughts, and so on and so forth. And then we can ask, how do these affect plant demography and ecosystem structure and function? Coming back to this topic of altered disturbance regimes, one way of talking about it is that when we talk about altered disturbance regimes, effectively what we're talking about are the indirect effects of a change in climate meaning an increasing extent, magnitude, and or frequency of uh, spruce beetle outbreaks, mountain pine beetle outbreaks, and of course wildfires. And then again here, we can ask the same question. How do these indirect effects of climate change affect plant de demography and ecosystem structure and function? So then for uh, today's conversation, the, the large question is, what are the consequences of the indirect and the direct effects of climate change on the composition of Rocky Mountain forests, including the dominance and extent of quaking aspen, which is uh, the specific focus at the moment? So I if there's an outline for um, this talk, it's to first consider the ind indirect effects of climate change, altered disturbance regimes. But then uh, if we were only going to do that without considering these altered disturbance regimes within the context of uh, an altered post-disturbance climate, then we'd only be talking about half of the story. So we'll, we'll visit this briefly and then uh, explore some possible future uh, scenarios for what this might mean for quaking aspen um, in the western U.S. So, uh, so first of all, the, the big thing we normally think about when we talk about ch altered disturbance regimes is a change in fire regimes, right? We, we're seeing larger fires, we're seeing more frequent fires, we're seeing more intense fires over the past uh, decade to several decades. And when we talk about um, altered fire regimes and quaking aspen, we have to think about the regeneration modes of aspen. So typically when we think about quaking aspen and its reproduction, we think of this scenario, which is the scenario of prolific clonal re-sprouting following sand replacing disturbances, usually uh, wildfires. And in these types of sands, aspen often has a successional relationship with more shade tolerant con conifers, usually spruce and fir. But we have to remember that this isn't the only um, regeneration mode of aspen. So for example, there are sands like this, which are, um, this particular sand is about 300 years old at least, and there, there's no evidence of that sand having been affected by any major disturbance, at least in the past several centuries. And as you can see, it's a relatively pure aspen sand in which aspen is continually regenerating under its own canopy. Another interesting thing when we talk about altered disturbance regimes is that these types of pure aspen sands tend to be less flammable than aspen sands 
uh, in which aspen has a successional relationship with conifers. And this is because pure aspen stands tend to be a little bit uh, more mesic than any stands mixed with conifers. And we'll, we'll weave that back into the conversation as, as we unfold it. Adding to, the, to this complexity is that aspen can reproduce from seed uh, as well as vegetatively. And this type of asexual reproduction is by far uh, more common and much more important in terms of aspen dominance on the landscape. But uh, uh, as, I'll think, as I think we'll hear more from, from Karen and Jim, and I'm not sure uh, whether Mary Lou is, is going to be here. OK, good. Thank you for ignoring that shutdown. Um, so uh, in spite of our federal government, we're going to learn a little bit more about this. But it is very interesting, because on a landscape scale, this may not be that important, but very important genetic consequences, as, as I think we'll hear about a little bit later. So uh, a number of years ago, we uh, looked at the effects of um, large wildfires on quaking aspen. And the context here is that, as I think we all know, aspen is the most widely distributed tree species in North America. So one of the consequences of that is that it spans a range of elevation, it spans a range of latitude, and it spans different um, uh, fire regime types. So for example, uh, this little figure shows, uh, the top figure shows a decline in the amount of aspen on the landscape. And so over the fa past 50 years or so, we may have observed that the amount of aspen is actually decreasing. But going back to some of the points that Greg was making in terms of understanding the historical context in order to be able to understand the impacts of climate change, uh, we have the following two scenarios. First of all, this one depicts a scenario in which uh, ecosystem fluctuations, historic range of variability, if you would like, is relatively narrow. Right? Uh, these types of ecosystems are representative, uh, represented by a relatively narrow range of conditions and are usually shaped by uh, relatively frequent disturbances. So let's say fires every um, several years to, to several decades. But in contrast, usually at higher elevation, we might have ecosystems that look something like this. So these are ecosystems that are typically shaped by more infrequent disturbances, uh, large fires, if we want to talk about wildfires. Uh, those disturbances tend to be larger, tend to be more severe, because they're less frequent. And in these types of systems, we have a broader range of conditions that can be considered natural. And within these conditions, if we observe a, a decrease or an abrupt increase that is perfectly consistent with past conditions. But in these types of systems, the same uh, magnitude of change in terms of aspen dominance in the landscape uh, can be indicative of an actual, <coughs> excuse me, um, variance outside of what would normally be expected for these systems. And so um, I won't go into the details of this study because I think some of you might be familiar with it. But uh, essentially what we did is we compared the amount of aspen in the landscape in the late 19th century versus the late 20th century. And the yellow bars here on the far left represent the amount of uh, aspen in the landscape during those two time periods. And the main message of this paper that came out in uh, 2004 and another paper that came out in 2006 was that this was for the Grand Mesa area of Colorado. And we also did a similar study in another area of Colorado. But the main message was that there was actually more aspen in the landscape right now than there was about 100 years ago. The reason for this is that this is actually the legacy of widespread severe wildfires in the late 1800s, uh, which have had a, a long-lasting effect on the amount of aspen in the landscape. And this type of phenomenon may be relevant uh, as we look forward into the future. <coughs> and looking at this in a little bit more detail, um, the columns on this figure represent forest type in the late 
19th century. And the rows represent forest type in the late 20th century. And we don't need to walk through this entire thing, but uh, I'll just draw your attention to a couple main points. One is that of the area that was unburned Aspen in, in the late 19th century, meaning th this was Aspen dominated in the late 1800s, and as far as we know, it has not burned over the past 100, 200 years, uh, the majority of it is actually still Aspen. And, th and these are these systems that we would expect to actually be more resistant to wildfires than the stands in which Aspen has a successional relationship with conifers. The other important point, which is kind of the mechanism behind uh, the, the figure we just looked at, is here. Of the stands that burned in the late 19th century, that were dominated by spruce and fir, the majority right now is dominated by quaking aspen. And th this just, again, is another testament to these large wildfires changing forest composition from conifers to spru um, uh, from conifers to aspen, and then that legacy remaining in the landscape for a very long time, a century uh, perhaps longer. So um, severe fires during the late 19th century increased uh, aspen cover. Uh, and those wildfires occurred during extreme drought during that time period. Drought that may be similar to what uh, is expected uh, for the upcoming decade. And as a result of this, 100 years later, at least in western Colorado where we study this, a larger portion of the landscape is dominated by aspen than prior to uh, those wildfires. So there's a long-lasting effect. So looking forward, if we believe that uh, wildfires are getting larger, if we observe that wildfires are getting more severe, more frequent, then the question we can ask is, what are the effects of this going to be on landscape composition, given this well-established relationship between conifers, aspen, and fire? Right? So if this were the only variable, if everything else were to remain unchanged, then the, the answer would be that the more wildfires we have in the landscape, the more aspen we're going to have. And uh, I could go back to my seat and drink coffee, and that would be the end of the talk, right? But of course, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's not, not that simple. But it's important to consider, I think, if we just take this one piece of the, of the story, then uh, we would expect more aspen in the landscape. Um, and then uh, the point that I made earlier, too, this is, I think, a, a fairly common uh, image that some of us in the room may have seen, which is that this is a photograph um, I took following a, a wildfire in Colorado in 2002, which shows coniferous forests uh, burned in the foreground and in that same area, uh, completely unburned uh, aspen stands. So the implication here is that fires increase the relative amount of aspen in the landscape, even setting aside this, this topic of regeneration and successional relationships. So by virtue of being less flammable, even if we, if we don't talk about these successional relationships, we can say wildfires are likely to increase the relative amount of um, aspen in the landscape. The absolute amount of aspen landscape will be contingent on regeneration. We also uh, have recognized that both uh, outbreaks of spruce beetle and mountain pine beetle are uh, driven by climate. And the effects of these outbreaks on aspen is ongoing, and I think it's a very important area of research. I, I don't think we're far enough along to be able to definitively make any conclusions. But I think we would probably be able to agree that at the very least, um, there's a potential to um, of this to increase aspen dominance by the same two mechanisms which we just discussed. Number one, decreasing dominance of conifers, so increasing the relative amount of aspen in the landscape. And number two, providing opportunities for aspen regeneration. And as with the wildfires, it's interesting to note that 
uh, aspen is not susceptible to these major uh, bark beetle outbreaks, spruce beetle and mountain pine beetle. So again, wildfires, uh, outbreaks of dendroctinus, all affect the conifers, but uh, not aspen. So again, if this were the only part of the story, we would expect more aspen in the landscape. Then the other uh, interesting change we're seeing is related to compounded disturbances. So the, if the extent, magnitude, and frequency of forest disturbances is increasing, it necessarily follows that the chance of two or more disturbance, disturbances occurring in short succession also increases, right? so-called compounded disturbances. And these compounded disturbances can affect ecosystem development in ways that are not well understood, although over the past 10 years, I think we, we've made a lot of progress in getting a handle on how compounded disturbances affect um, forest dynamics. And uh, this is um, uh, some work we did in the Mount Zirkel Wilderness, which is up here in northwestern Colorado. In, um, high elevation forest, partly dominated by conifers, partly dominated by quaking aspen. And this area, from a research perspective, had an, uh, an interesting history. From uh, the management perspective, this was a uh, disaster, but uh, for us it was quite interesting. What happened was, uh, in 1997 there was a windstorm that blew down 10,000 hectares of forest in, in a single afternoon. And then following that, five years later in 2002, there were major wildfires in this area. So it provided this uh, extraordinary research design uh, which made it possible to look at the effects of single disturbances versus these so-called compounded disturbances. So the, the major question here was how do pre-fire composition and disturbance history affect the abundance and composition of post-fire regeneration. So in other words, how does what ha it, th there's this idea that um, especially severe disturbances like wildfire reset succession, right? But I think that idea has been actually overplayed in the uh, ecological literature and we uh, played with it in this study. And so in the foreground here, you see a stand that was affected by both the windstorm and subsequent uh, wildfire. And in, uh, we, we set up over 1,000 permanent plots uh, in 2003, and this was with, with funding from the Joint Fire Science Program. We measured these in 2003, 2004, and 2005, and then our funding ran out. And then uh, in 2010, we were able to go back and re-measure uh, some of those. And it, this is uh, a couple of the things we found. And so in this figure, uh, on the vertical axis, we have total juveniles per hectare. And we say juveniles because we group uh, seedling and all aspen, so those that reproduce sexually and asexually. Uh, this is the time period here. And the different lines here represent pre-forest composition. So for example, this line represents total regeneration in stands that were dominated by aspen prior to 2002, prior to the wildfire. Uh, this is all regeneration in stands that were dominated by lodgepole pine, and this is all regeneration that was in stands dominated by spruce and fir prior to the fire. And what we see here is, I think, no uh, great surprise to any of us. What we see is that stands that were dominated by quaking aspen were characterized by uh, more abundant regeneration uh, than any of the conifers. And then lodgepole pine was, was in second place here b because of its serotony, uh, more regeneration there than in um, stands dominated by spruce and fir. So that's fine. Um, but then it, here's the interesting part of the story. <coughs> so here, um, the axes are the same, but the lines represent, uh, this time, the regeneration of particular species. So the little triangles here represent uh, lodgepole pine, and the circles represent regeneration of quaking aspen. The diamonds represent regeneration of 
subalpine fir, and the squares represent regeneration of Engelmann spruce. So when we look at stands, they were, um, they were affected only by a single disturbance, wildfire in this case. We see uh, quaking aspen and lodgepole pine uh, leading the way, and regeneration of those two species is greater than of uh, spruce and fir. And after about, what is it, seven, eight years, um, lodgepole pine actually pulls ahead in stands that were only burned, affected by only a single disturbance. And this is due to the uh, relatively high serotony of lodgepole pine in this area. But look at this. When we look at stands that were affected by compounded disturbances, meaning a windstorm followed by a wildfire, the, the story changes. Now, all of a sudden, Aspen is clearly dominant. Uh, and then lodgepole pine falls into a distant second place. Right? So, and we're working out the mechanisms for this, but most likely this has to do with um, the fact that um, the, uh, um, the secondary disturbance might uh, destroy the seed source of, of the conifers, uh, something that aspen, which reproduces vegetatively, would be less susceptible to. It may also be that fire severity and fire intensity is actually increased in areas recently affected by, um, by wind. So maybe there are some effects on soil, uh, seeds in the soil bank, soil properties, and set, et cetera. But whatever it is, the, the story is again the same, that if we have an increase in compounded disturbances, which we think we will going forward into the future, actually it, it's almost certain to be the case, again, if this were the only thing happening, uh, we would again expect to see more aspen in the landscape because it is able to do better in stands affected by compounded disturbances um, than our conifers. And then the other point, again, the same point that we made about wildfires and insect outbreaks, aspen is also less susceptible, actually, uh, to wind damage in this particular case. Right? So, so far in all these scenarios, aspen has, uh, does better in regenerating following these disturbances and at the same time is less susceptible to being damaged by them. Let's see. So, um, but then here, we, we have to consider this whole story in the context of the same climatic changes that are driving these disturbances, right? So, aspen demography, as the demography of, of all plants, is contingent on climate. So it's not only that climate is driving these altered disturbance regimes, it necessarily will affect how species respond to those. Um, and so the question then becomes, what is the direct effect of the same climatic conditions that indirectly favor Aspen? So we see that uh, climate, by altering disturbance regimes, favors Aspen. But what, what about the direct effect? Right? How do those play in? So uh, more broadly speaking, understanding the links between climate variability and tree mortality is an important goal of current uh, ecological research. And it's also true that this is something that remains poorly understood for widespread species, including quaking aspen. And again, this is an area where I think collectively we're making a lot of progress. And I think given the types of challenges that Greg was laying out, I think we still have uh, a ways to go here. Another, okay, thank you. Another uh, issue here is that um, we normally think about species near ecotones being most uh, susceptible to climatically induced stress. But around the world, not only with aspen, but other systems, uh, we see that trees actually not only in these transitional zones are showing uh, signs of climatic stress. And uh, a, a couple of studies that have come up, uh, Paul Rogers uh, as well as others, have been uh, moving this direction of arguing that what is happening to Aspen right now is uh, a function of climate. And what we've been seeing over the past 
uh, years is something like this, right? Uh, very sudden uh, onset of mortality of uh, quaking aspen across the West, not only in transitional zones. And this is something that uh, Jim Worrell and others pointed out fairly early, and this is something that is still ongoing. And so we uh, looked at this by uh, selecting a number of those stands in which aspen were dying to, effect, to essentially look at the effects of climate on that mortality. And briefly, what we found is that the red bars represent significant correlations between tree growth and, in this case, uh, temperature during the various seasons, the current summer, the current spring, and moving backwards uh, in time. And what we found is that uh, there's a very strong negative correlation between temperature and growth, meaning the warmer it is, the slower aspen grow in these stands uh, that are affected by this mortality. There's a strong positive relationship with precipitation, meaning that the drier it is, the slower trees grow. And um, I, I won't torture you with the details of GLM models, but um, if you look collectively at the trees that have died recently and the trees that are still alive, the ones that died have had reduced growth for a number of years, meaning mortality is not an instantaneous process, but rather a culmination of uh, several years. And if you we look at this over time, mortality uh, actually peaks at times during um, greater uh, drought. Sorry to blow through this a little bit, but I'm getting, I'm getting the red, red signs over here. Um, so, uh, if we think about this collectively, right, um, we're seeing changing climate, right? And so what does that do? Well, it uh, leads to more fires, more outbreaks, more compounded disturbances, more drought. Uh, more fires, all other things being unchanged would lead to more aspen in the landscape. More outbreaks, all other things being unchanged would lead to more aspen, more compounded disturbances, the same, but more drought would actually reduce the amount of aspen in the, in the landscape. So, but all these things are happening simultaneously, right? So where it, does that leave us? Well, the, the big challenge for the future, I think, is for us to better understand the relative importance of disturbances versus altered climatic conditions on aspen dynamics. Because if the influence of disturbances ends up being more important and aspen is able to survive and importantly regenerate following those disturbances, then we can reasonably expect more aspen in the landscape. But if this influence of climate ends up being more important, meaning that despite the potential created by altered disturbance regime, aspen is not able to realize that potential, um, then we're going to end up with less aspen on the landscape. So um, where does that go? And um, more importantly, what kinds of feedbacks might we expect given those scenarios? Well, so if disturbances, if the effect of disturbances becomes more important, meaning that aspen can realize the potential to expand uh, its dominance in the landscape in spite of altered climatic conditions, meaning it's able to regenerate and survive, and we have more aspen in the landscape, well, if we have more aspen in the landscape, it would be reasonable to expect uh, less areas affected by wildfires, less areas affected by outbreaks, uh, less areas affected by compounded disturbances, and less areas affected by wind damage. If that's all true, then essentially what we're setting ourselves up for is some sort of negative feedback. And uh, I dare say this starts looking like a stabilizing factor for disturbance-driven ecological change. Could that be the case? It's one possibility. But if the direct effects of climate change end up being more important, that is, aspen is not able to regenerate, it's not able to survive, well, then we have less aspen in the landscape. And where does that leave us? Well, uh, two possibilities. We could end up with more conifers in the landscape, but 
uh, I think we would be hard pressed to make that argument just because everything we're seeing uh, points to conifers actually uh, losing out in all of these scenarios. Uh, so the, the other possibility, which unfortunately I think might be the more realistic one, is that if Aspen is not able to expand into some of these areas, we might actually have a conversion to non-forest systems. So um, to some, increases in individual and compounded disturbances have the potential to promote Aspen dominance, but only if post-disturbance climate is suitable for Aspen survival and regeneration. So I think it's very important that we consider in the same breath the direct and the indirect effects of climate change. Uh, because continued drought has the potential to hinder Aspen dominance, uh, not only because it, it affects the, the type of mortality that we've been seeing recently, but also because of its potential effects on Aspen regeneration. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll hear some talks later. I know the schedule got uh, shuffled this, this morning even, but um, I'm hoping we're going to hear some uh, story uh, talks about the effects of changing climate on post-disturbance Aspen regeneration, because I think this is an essential part of this whole story. And it'll be essential uh, in our understanding, in our ability to correctly describe and anticipate uh, potential future scenarios. And so uh, finally, the theme that I've been weaving in and out of this talk is that we need to understand the relative importance of altered disturbance regimes and of climate. I think it's, it's very tempting uh, to fall into one or the other to look at only the effects of climate or look at only the effects of uh, altered disturbance regimes. But the reality is both of these are going to be, be having an effect not only on Aspen dynamics but actually on um, uh, most forests and other ecosystems. And then finally to consider uh, these feedbacks, right, that I think will be quite important. So if we're working with uh, predictive models, if we're trying to actually um, map out what this is going to look like in the future, uh, we should explicitly consider these potential interactions not only among individual disturbances, right, but uh, in addition how those individual disturbances interact with each other uh, as well as with climate to affect uh, potential ecosystem trajectories. So uh, if there were to be a concluding uh, statement, it would be that the consequences of changing disturbance regimes for quaking aspen are likely to be complex uh, and contingent on the effects of post-disturbance climate as well as these feedbacks among climate disturbances and forest composition. Thank you for your kind attention. Yes. Aspen can uh, be affected obviously by a number of different disease organisms uh, changing the course of costs uh, affecting the roots. Um, to what extent uh, is there evidence to suggest an effect of climate on, uh, on those uh, disease, disease causing agents for Aspen? Yeah. Is that, uh, Jim Worrell is, wasn't able to make it, is that correct? He's not here? Yeah, uh, this is something that Jim Worrell uh, has, has been doing great work on. And um, I think one of the things that his work, as well as some other work, points to is that uh, climatic s stress can predispose Aspen to, to some of these diseases and, and actually certain um, insects as well. So it kind of reduces the threshold. And so I think w one of the things we can see is that, um, you know, we can talk about the fact that climate is driving mortality of Aspen, and I think that's true. But when we look at the actual mechanisms that are bringing about the mortality, I think we're going to get into talking about these types of diseases, insects, and so forth. Yeah. Greg, yeah. Is there any evidence that stand structure, clone, age, or density has any influence on any of these factors? On um, Aspen, uh, on this climatically driven mortality? Yeah, you know, in our work, we looked at 
uh, aspen stands that were all about 130 years old. So we were kind of controlling for that. And we didn't notice any effect of age or stand structure or something like that. But also our, our study wasn't really um, set up to deal with that. But I think one important thing is that most of the mortality that, the, that we were observing just informally in the field was among the canopy trees. And most of the stands actually had quite abundant regeneration, but not all, right? not all. So I think from what we've seen, um, this type of drought stress is primarily affecting the canopy trees. And the advanced regeneration in the subcanopy trees seem to be doing OK. But an open question is, what will this look like as climatic extremes get um, more extreme? So, one thing I'd like to ask to be considered in factors in the future, um, say the future of asking how it responds to crop kind of services is the pressure from the Yeah. So, how does that, like, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's in the scope, you know, of this, but what are your thoughts? Can I repeat the question? Uh, it, it, the question was uh, it, it, uh, how would. Um, Aspen dynamics following compounded disturbances be affected by browsing by ungulates? Uh, you know, it, it's, an, it's an interesting question. Um, one of the things we observed, although didn't study formally uh, in this uh, context of blowdown followed by wildfire, is that actually the fallen trees uh, acted as um, e effective exclusions to ungulates and, and uh, various other animals, so that what was happening in there was actually protected from browsing pressure. Now, th this is obviously true for, um, uh, for wind storms. But if we talk about the, the big question, I think, that's on a lot of people's minds is, what will stands develop, uh, how will stands develop um, following bark beetle outbreaks after those same stands are burned, even setting aside the question of whether there's a causal relationship between the two. But I think the answer to that question is if the trees remain standing, right, then I think that this might be, uh, er, there might be a real effect of browsing on post disturbance regeneration. But if the trees fall prior to fire, then I think there might be some sheltering effect of, of the fallen log. Thank you.